Hi guys! Welcome to Bookseller Chat, Independent Bookstore Romance Day Edition. I'm Elise. I'm Gabrielle. And we're going to talk about some of our favorite, favorite romance books today. So Gabrielle, what is Independent Bookstore Romance Day? So Independent Bookstore Romance Day is a day to celebrate indies who love, love romance as much as the readers do. Um, a lot of people were going to online retailers for their romance because they didn't necessarily feel like they were comfortable purchasing romance in a bookstore that mostly sold things like literary fiction, nonfiction, and kids books, kids books, and they wanted something that felt a little bit more intimate, a little bit more personal. And so, Independent Bookstore Romance Day is a way of showing our re showing the readers and showing our customers that we value romance as much as they do. I love that. That's good. So, so Gabrielle. Why are you into romance? Why are you an Unlikely Stories go-to romance bookseller? I got into romance a couple years ago after reading Pride and Prejudice and going down the movie rabbit hole, and I just wanted something similar. I wanted a read-alike, I wanted more of that, but I wanted something a little bit more modern, um, a little bit less dense, something just kind of light and fluffy, and I kind of took to, I think it was Tumblr at the time, to look That's for great. recommendations and see what other people were reading, and that got me hooked through um, Julia Quinn, Tessa Dare, a lot of historical authors um, that are kind of the modern Jane Austen, and it's a much more feminist, much more modern take on some really classic tropes, and it's so, just a lot of fun. Can I interrupt you? When you say the modern Jane Austen, what do you mean? Like, we're just writing Jane Austen stories again and again and again? Like, they're modern AUs? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so with the modern Jane Austen, a lot of these are um, categorized as Regency novels. They're set during the Regency period. Um, you have the balls, you have the parties, you have the... The regent? The Napoleon? Regent. <laughs> you get a lot of different um, takes on what life might have been like at the time. You have... Um, All good stuff. Just it's... The it's etiquette. A variety. The etiquette, the social rules, it plays with it in a lot of ways that are really fun and really unique that you might not see in a Jane Austen novel, but are kind of hinted upon or... Um, it just delves a little bit deeper based on what you like from those Jane Austen novels. Because Jane doesn't really go off, go beyond the proposal and the kiss, right? Not really. <laughs> Not usually. So what about you? What got you into romance? Well, like you, I started with Jane Austen, was very into Jane Austen from a young age. I'm a history major, history person. I just finished my master's in a topic that had to do with the Regency and had to do with marriage. So all those themes that you mentioned about Jane Austen are things that are very personal to me and things that I really like and appreciate. And like you, I wanted to see more of that in the books that I was reading. Also, I am a big movie person. Everyone knows that when I recommend books, I say it's like X movie. And the movies I love the most are rom-coms. And most romance novels are rom-coms, especially the modern romances. And they haven't been making a lot of romance movies lately. Like, there's been a bit of a revival going on now, but like, in middle school and high school, there was nothing. And so I love books that are like, you've got mail. Like coolest, like my favorite rom-com movies, and there's so many of them. Um, the book that really got me kind of into the romance track was actually the book that came before the movie of The Princess Diaries. Meg Cabot's The Princess Diaries is so good. It's such a good YA series. If you haven't read it, stop watching this video and like go read it. Go read it, and then come back and watch the rest of this video. Uh, so Meg Cabot also writes adult romance, and also. In general, I feel like a natural progression from YA love stories is romance, especially the ones there's like a lot about 20-somethings now. Yeah. It I just felt like too. the next step. And there's so many, and they're so good, and they should all be movies. Because I love rom-com movies as much as I love romance books. Mm -hmm. And there should be more of them. And that's my story. So speaking of Meg Cabot and the Princess Diaries, Princess Diaries is obviously amazing. Like, here's my copy of the first one. Over yonder is my bookshelf with the rest of the books in the series because they're amazing. But Meg Cabot's still writing books, and she has a new one coming out on the 11th called No Offense. It's the sequel to her book that came out last year called No Judgments. Uh, this has been defined as a cozy mystery meets library romance. Mysteries and romance are my two favorite genres, so I haven't read it yet, but I'm very excited. Also, Meg, my girl Meg, because apparently we're on a first name basis. I think we're on a first name We should be on a first name basis. Is the ambassador <laughs> for Independent Bookstore Romance Day. I don't know what that entails, but that just means we're doing a lot of promotions about Meg Cabot. I 
every day for me is appreciate my cabot day, but I guess this is an especially appreciative appreciate my cabot day. So I believe she's also doing some yeah. online events with different bookstores. You should be able to find those in the links below. Um, and on her Instagram page, I noticed I follow her. She's been posting them a lot. So yeah, no offense by Meg Cabot. So now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of our favorite books from the past year or so, some books that we really love and some books that we think um, you guys will really love that are coming out from some of our favorite authors in the next year. And we have all of our books here, and if you watch to the end of the video, we will have them all pictured so you can get nice close-ups of the covers, and ideally, whoever posts this video will have them listed below. So I'm just going to start off with um, a little bit of romance history for historicals. Um, this one right here is called Castles in the Air. Um, it's a Christina Dodd book and part of the reason I was talking before about somehow um, sometimes people are uncomfortable um, coming into an independent bookstore and looking for romance is often because of the covers. We all know the Fabio covers, the classic romance covers, the bodice rippers. Um, they are usually on the steamier side. Some of them are kind of ridiculous but they actually have a pretty cool history for them. Um, like things like this. This one here is famous because um, the heroine, believe it or not, has three arms. I'm not sure if you can see it here, we'll zoom in at the end, but there is one here holding his hand, there is one here supporting her on the ground, and then there's another one tucked right up against her side. Love it. A lot of these paintings and things are kind of what made these famous, these books famous, because even though they look like they're kind of steamy and like all that, but they are so much more. They are hilarious, they are funny, they are warm. They're feminist. They're feminist. They are so, so great. They are great for escapism, and they have some really cool stories in there. It's not just all about the romance. So I wanted to get started by mentioning a few of my favorite authors. Um, I brought this one here, Brazen and the Beast, by Sarah McLean. She's incredible. I love her. She's hilarious. Um, this one is about Hattie, who is a 29-year-old spinster who is kind of on the shelf and like expected that she probably won't find a marriage match, but she declares that being 29 is going to be her year, the year of Hattie, until she finds a boxer named the Beast tied up in her carriage, and Question. things go haywire. What does on the shelf mean? Like, is that like a frequent thing? It's usually used to as like a trope where um, they might not have found someone during their first couple seasons, which usually happened around like age 18 to 20. And usually by after a couple of years, they stop going to the balls. They kind of take a step back from looking for a husband. So they're like more mature and like maybe a little shy. Yeah. Cool. Usually the wallflowers. Cool. Continue. Um, so on top of Sarah McLean being an awesome author, she is also a podcaster and she is one half of the Faded Mates podcast team. And they are a great place to look for recommendations, romance history, anything to do with the genre. It's a lot of fun highly recommend checking that out as well. And I don't have their books with me today, but I also wanted to recommend Tessa Dare, who is another historical author. She also works in the Regency. Yeah, she's so good. I love her. She's funny, she's entertaining. Um, she has a series like um, about women inheriting castles that's a lot of fun. Her most recent series, um, her newest book was The Wallflower Wager. There's a goat. It's funny. Read it. It's amazing. You will love it. I really like the Spindle Cove series. Again, that's it's a good great. Series. Um, there's also her book, When the Scott Ties a Knot, there's a lobster. Aww, he's her lobster. <laughs> she has a lot of fun with animal companions. Um, also, like, is that just a Friends reference, or like, am I just being funny? It's probably a Friends reference, Good. knowing her. <laughs> love that. I love seeing, like, little modern references in books. There's so many. Eloisa James is another one that's really known for that. She is, um, that's her pen name. Her actual name is Mary Bly, and she's a Shakespeare professor at Fordham. Love that. And there is a Shakespeare reference in every single one of her books. Um, her most recent was Say Yes to the Duke. Again, very funny. It's part of her um, Wilds of Winlow Castle series featuring this family, this crazy huge family. Um, it's a rom-com. It's very much like an answer to Julia Quinn's Bridgerton series. And um, TV continue. It, yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about more about that later. Um, it's also great for diversity, for uh, mental health rep. It's really great. Um, Romance. It's not just about sex. It's not. It's very far from that. There's so much more to it. Um, if you're looking for like a good mystery, a good, um, sometimes even a gothic horror, like I know recently there was the Ray Cast, which is based off of Mary Shelley's life. There is, um, you can go through to like Nora Roberts. She writes also as J.D. Robb and does romantic suspense. You can find fantasy, you can find 
um, sci-fi like Jesse McCallick. Um, there's so much out there. There's something there for everyone. So Gabrielle, before you move on to your next book, I need to know what's up with the croquet mallet. This right here, you might have seen it earlier in the video. This is the Bridgerton Mallet of Death. Um, the Bridgerton series by Julia Quinn features a ongoing um, kind of in-joke about the black croquet mallet in their games. Is it croquet or is it Paul Mall? Technically Paul Mall. Kind of works it's, like it's croquet. It's croquet. It's fancy croquet. Basically. And every year the siblings get together and have a massive game that gets exceedingly competitive. The black mallet is usually hidden and like hunted down before the event. Um, it's nuts. Because it's cool. It gets thrown in the water. It gets beat up. Beat thing. up. <laughs> it's awesome. It's a running, it's a running joke within the series. Um, another one that will pop up more often is Miss Butterworth and the Mad Baron, which is yes. going to be a graphic novel coming out next year. Um, and it's about murderous pigeons, um, strange gothic horror, and it's featured as a popular reading choice for characters within the novel. Book within a book. It is, and it's a lot of fun. Love that. So, you've mentioned it like a bunch of times. Put the people out of their misery and tell them, what is the Bridgerton series? The Bridgerton... Before I do. <laughs> the Bridgerton series is awesome. Yep, um, it's, agreed. There's a couple of them here. I've got The Duke and I, which is the first book. It's an old beat-up used copy because I've read this thing a million times. And we've got Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. And it's a series about this family of, I think there are eight kids? Yeah. And they're all named alphabetically, A through whatever. Let's see, can I do it? Ready? Anthony, Benedict, Colin, Daphne, Eloise, Francesca, Gregory, Hyacinth. Yep. Aye! <laughs> so one of the ongoing threads in the Bridgerton series is a character called Lady Whistledown, which kind of functions as like an 1800s gossip girl. XOXO, Lady Whistledown. Basically. She's writing back and forth um, about like what people are wearing, all the different scandals happening at these balls and society events who looked ridiculous, who was the shining star of the night, who was the best debut. The excerpts um, are at the beginning of each chapter and kind of set the stage for what's going to happen in that chapter. Yeah. Or what happened beforehand, the consequences, which will set up the next chapter. It's a really fun way of structuring these, and it keeps you tied back to it. Um, these ended up, were actually first published in the 90s, I believe? Yeah, I think it started in 95, 96. Somewhere around there. So very old as me. And there are eight of them. One of the reasons we are still reading this now is that Bridgerton is coming to Netflix. Woohoo! It is going to be amazing. It's done by Shonda Rhimes, who yes. also had a hand in the second Princess Diaries movie. It and was... also Grey's Anatomy and How to Get Away with Murder. Oh, it's yeah. Shonda Rhimes. She's and amazing. still Starcrossed, which was amazing. They canceled on ABC, and I'm still salty, which bears you mentioning. Because <laughs> it was great. And on top of that, we also have a colorblind cast for a Ooh. Regency. Yes. Is... And there's people of color in a thing set in the 1800s Big in Britain? Yeah. Crazy! <laughs> Who would have thought? It's about time. There were not white people in other parts of history. Amazing. Yeah, it's great. They're really doing a good job with it. We also have Julie Andrews in there, which, again, so good. Grandma from the Princess Diaries. She's also, amazing. If anyone watches the show, because it's the best show on Netflix right now, Claire from Derry Girls is going to be my girl Penelope. I love and Penelope. Penelope is the heroine from Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. I think she's my favorite through the entire series. She's my favorite. She's awesome. That's why that's one of the books that we pulled. <laughs> yeah, she's awesome. I love her story. Her and Colin are adorable. She's great. All right, this has been our, you know, plug for Penelope. So we'll wrap up with um, historicals and let's move on to something else. Contemporary. All right, it's my turn to be on screen again, and I'm going to be talking about some more modern rom-coms and romances that we have. So we're going to go back in time a bit and talk about the best book of 2019. By Not far. even the best romance, just the best book of 2020, 2019. I know yours, in my opinion. This is Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. It was her debut, right? Yep, it was her debut. It was her debut, and what a debut it was. So it follows uh, Alex. Claremont Diaz, I know his last name. Claremont Diaz, he is the son of the first female president of the United States who won the 2016 election, so this is, you know, the better timeline. Um, yeah, I'm getting political. <laughs> and he is awesome and brash and fun and loud and is the arch rival of the son of the heir to the throne, so the grandson of the Queen of England, Prince Henry of Wales. And they hate each other, they just can't get along. So of course there's an incident 
and they're forced to spend time together and pretend to be friends. So, you know, wash over, gloss over, the diplomatic incident. And guess what? They don't hate each other. They love each other. So it's a political romance. It's enemies to lovers. It is an LGBTQ romance. There are a bunch of those right now, and they're all great. I can totally think of other ones right now. Olivia Waite has a couple good ones. Those are historicals. Whatever ones can you think of? Oh, in the past month, we've had Conventionally Yours. True. We've had Boyfriend Material, both, which are great follow-ups to Red, White, and Royal Blue if you're looking for something funny that's along the same lines. Yep. Also, Casey McQuiston, I think next year, her next book, One Last Stop, comes out. And that is a kind of sci-fi mystery romance about two ladies. So that's Casey McQuiston. And she's also a queer author, which is awesome, so you get a little bit of own voices in there. Yes, and we'll talk about that later. So, that was 2019, but for books coming out this year, um, I want to talk about The Worst Best Man and Recipe for Persuasion. I'll talk about these kind of at the same time. So, this came out in the winter, spring, the before times, before quarantine, whenever that was. And, Three years ago. Yep. And The Worst Best Man is excellent. So, uh, Carolina Santos is a wedding planner who was dumped by her fiancé the day of their wedding and really blames all of that on his brother who she thinks convinced him to cancel the wedding and for reasons that I will not ruin for you is forced to work with said brother of ex-fiancé in order to save her business. So, so this is a book I would classify as a own voices book which is a book written by a person of color, LGBTQ community, someone within a community writing about their own community uh, our main character, Catalina, is Afro-Brazilian, and of course, Mia Souza, her, the author of the book, is Afro-Brazilian. Another own voices book that I really liked that came out this year was Recipe for Persuasion by Sonali Dev. Uh, it's kind of not quite a sequel, but definitely in conversation with her first book, Pride and Prejudice and Other Flavors. Actually, I don't think it's her first book, but it's like the first book that I know of hers. She's got a pretty big backlog, so there's a lot to dive into if you really love her. So yeah, it's not her first book. I first book in the series, though. First book in this series universe, which, if you haven't picked up by those titles, are clearly modern Desi AUs of our alternate universes of Jane Austen's novels. So, of course, Persuasion, which is the best Jane Austen novel, near and dear to my heart, is the focus of this book. Uh, our main character is uh, has a struggling Indian restaurant, and to try to save her family business is going on a celebrity cooking show to try to gain attention for her business and it's forced it's one of those like celebrity team competitions it's forced to work with her ex who she still has feelings for who is a famous soccer player so feelings and ingredients fly in this very messy kitchen modern adaptation of persuasion also technically not a romance but if you're looking for jane austen please read persuasion because i know not many people have persuasion. all right so those are books that i've read already this year that i've really loved um, other ro I've read a lot of romances during quarantine. I didn't want to go through all of them at once, but if you look at my craft videos, which are also on this YouTube page, you will find plenty of other romances that I'm not recommending here now. But there's a lot that have been coming out, and they're all amazing. One that I've just started, so I don't really have a full review yet, but I do want to mention because it's got a lot of buzz, is One to Watch. This was recommended to me by another bookseller at our store, Colleen, who does not cannot say enough nice things about this book like she she didn't force me but like basically i have chosen this book solely because of colleen colleen thank you and it's good so far it's called one to watch by kate stamen london and it is kind of a play off of the idea of the bachelor it is a woman who goes onto a reality show called main squeeze and is obviously this on the cover she's a plus size woman going as the star of a reality dating show and it deals with body positivity, it deals with finding love. It's very cute so far, I can't wait to, wait to read the rest. All the reviews I've heard are fantastic. And that's one to watch, so watch for my full review when I finish it. <laughs> um, but I do want to say, as all of these books that I've read, all these modern ones, have these really cute cartoon covers. I know Gabrielle was talking earlier about people being kind of concerned about the, um, covers of old historical romances like the fabio covers and covers that maybe look dirty and i really like these cartoon covers because like i have to admit i was one of those people but i don't know i like i like the cartoon covers i know you have issues with them sometimes there's a lot of discourse on them right now because some people like the cartoon which is great for people who might be a little bit more shy about what they're reading like i um, could read this on the beach and not like feel bad about oh, it definitely 
they're also a great way to show more diversity because you might not be able to find like the stock cover models that fit your exact character or it might be a little bit more difficult with whatever um, photography agency you're going through um, but they all there's also something to be said about the female gaze which we don't see it often like how I, like, I just like the typography on all these you know cartoon ones i just feel like they use cool fonts and another book about cool fonts which i didn't pull today love lettering which i've recommended before all my videos so good um also something i was going to mention that i didn't was um when i was talking about own voices and diversity in modern romance which is definitely getting there but isn't as great as it could be but i think there definitely more is more representation in romance than there is in rom-coms and on tv right now we're moving in the right direction but there's still a long way to go yeah bridgerton's in the right direction but um if you're concerned about that or want to look for more diverse books um every year the rip bodice which is a romance specific bookstore in la which is fantastic uh, does a diversity report and reflects upon the different publishers and how well they're doing diversity wise. So give that a look out. Alright, so the last book I'm going to mention hasn't actually come out yet. It comes out in September, but it's a sequel in a series, and I love both of them and I can't get enough of them, so I'm going to recommend it anyways and show you the first book. It is The book is Well Played by Jenda Luca. It's coming out at the end of September. It is the second in her Well, whatever series because that's like the theme for the titles i think it's technically called like the um what's the name of the town willow creek the willow creek renaissance fair <laughs> series whatever she's calling it they're all amazing the first one came out last year it's called well met and it, they are all modern romances that take place in a little small town renaissance fair and if you're watching an unlikely stories youtube page i'm assuming you might be around the new england area so you probably know and miss as much as i do King Richard's Renaissance Fair, which is not happening this year. I'm still sad about that. I am so upset. And especially because I've been reading these books and I've been in, like, Ren Fair mode all year. Anyways, if you're missing Renaissance Fairs or want to travel to one in your mind, Well Met and Well Played are so good. Well Met follows Emily and Simon. You know, uh, Emily's new in town and Simon is the director of Willow the Willow Creek Renaissance Fair. And it's a little bit enemies to lovers, but not really because the whole enemies thing is... A misunderstanding but it's very cute I love it it's sweet well played is a continuation of the series Simon and Emily who are precious and I would die for both of them are still very much there they're in the background but it follows longtime Willow Creek Renaissance Fair wench Stacy and she is in kind of a long distance letter writing scenario with one of the um, lead singers of the bands that come to Willow Creek every year. Except she kind of isn't. Um, I don't know if you guys know what Serrano de Bergerac is, but there seem to be a lot of Serrano de Bergerac adaptations of things this year. Like, popular. there was the very big James McAvoy play that I saw advertised everywhere in March, because I think they were streaming it during quarantine. And there's, like, a few other... It was rem- a YA novel that came out. Yes. Um, it was a lesbian Sierra. Cyr- no, the Netflix movie. I have no oh, idea what it's called. Oh, that one, too. Yeah. There was that one Sir as well. de Bergerac is happening. If you know what that means, you pretty much understood the summary of Well Played. If not, September, whatever, when it comes out, I will tell you in the comments or at the end. You will find out. Comes out then. Also, Stacy's cat is named Benedict, and her stage name when she is a wench is Beatrice, which is obviously after Benedict and Beatrice for Much Ado About Nothing, which is the best Shakespeare play, and any romance novel that is based on Much Ado About Nothing is my favorite romance in my favorite tropes like the second Bridgerton book was it the Viscount who loved me which is Anthony's book very very much Beatrice and Benedict vibes there is also much ado- much ado about you by Eloisa James if you're looking for more yes all all the much ado about nothing all the time please so that is my shout out to super cool author Jen Luca all right so that's all the books that we read and recommend well the few that we selected we recommend a lot more uh, that we have recommended so far for today. Um, things that are coming out in the future, we had one that comes out in September that I recommended, but other things that are coming out in the future that I also recommend are A Rogue of One's Own by Evie Dunmore. Anything else that you recommend? Um, there's Alyssa Cole, who writes fantastic historical and modern, and she's an own voices writer. She's got her new one, um, the Runaways Royal Ser- Runaway Royal series, and that's coming out, I believe, in December. Just, I highly recommend her. I love everything we she's written. Definitely have a lot of her books in store. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? 
Is there Eloisa James that you mentioned? Yes, Eloisa James also has My Last Duchess, which is the next one in her Wild series that is coming out soon. I will put when exactly somewhere in the comments. It will be there. Maybe. Um, hopefully. Uh, I don't know how the editing works. And that's pretty much it for today. Um, please enjoy these books and tell us if you enjoy them. Also, please contact us at An Unlikely Story. If you have any questions or want more recommendations for romance, we love talking about romance. There are plenty of other booksellers that talk love talking about romance. Looking at you, Colleen and Miranda. There's a lot of us, and we do YA, we do adults, we do genre fiction, so if there's any, like, if you're looking for a fantasy romance, we can do that too. So, we got paranormals, you. Paranormals, fantasy, you name it, we have it. Yeah. So, happy Independent Bookstore Day from An Unlikely Story, who will o hopefully be your independent romance bookstore. We'd be happy to have you in. Bye, guys! <laughs>